I'm going live now, okay? Yeah. As soon as you see live on that, you know, I think just one second. Okay. So welcome to Anazuri's Friday evening uh, webinar on animal welfare. First, I would like to welcome Dr. Naveen Pandey. We're very excited to have him here, specifically on Christmas evening. So Merry Christmas to all our viewers. Would like to inter, uh, introduce Anna Jury for the first time viewers. Anna Jury is a nonprofit platform that engages in and promotes various initiatives that are striving for social change, owning leadership skills, and building entrepreneurship capabilities in Northeast. In the, first, uh, in the past few months, we have been engaging with uh, speakers from various fields via virtual media to create network among the people working in this region. Today, we are very excited to have uh, Dr. Navin Pandey. He is a Dep deputy director and veterinary advisor at the Corbett Foundation in Kaziranga. Dr. Pandey holds a master degree in conservation medicine from University of Edinburgh. He graduated as a vet two decades ago, and have been working in the welfare of animals, nature, and community around forests. He was involved in designing two veterinary hospitals, one in Drizzling and one in Rajasthan for camels. There's a lot more to say about uh, Dr. Pandey. Um, he moved from hardcore animal only work uh, which he did for 10 years, and then he moved to Corbett Foundation to widen his area of work and fulfill his passion of traveling, photography, reading, writing, and working on mitigation measure of human and wildlife conflict in different states of India. He has various interests. Um, some of them uh, are wildlife conservation, disease control, human wildlife con conflict, so social entrepreneurship, veterinary medicine, rural development, life, livestock economics, et cetera, et cetera. So um, there's so much to hear from you. So without further ado, the platform is yours, uh, Dr. Pandey. So uh, could you please uh, tell us about yourself? You have around 30 minutes or so. And after that, we will have a question answer series. Uh, thank you, uh, Anazori, for giving this opportunity to uh, talk to your team and uh, people who are uh, present online and who will be uh, listening to this talk uh, later on. Um, so thank you very much. I won't take much time talking about myself. Rather, I like to talk actually uh, what, uh, what I do and what drives me to keep on the path of uh, animal conservation and welfare. Uh, I graduated as a vet and now it has been two, two decades. And uh, after graduating as a vet, I moved to the hills in, in Darjeeling. And uh, that was my first visit to hills. And uh, it was, I, was, I had not planned whether I was going to stay for that long, but I ended up uh, staying for seven uh, long years in, in the hills. Um, so I'll be uh, briefly actually uh, talking about what shaped my interests. Um, as, as I was growing, we, I, I come from a family of teachers and readers. So we, have been, we had been introduced to books at quite early age. Uh, and uh, Peter Singer's Animal Liberation was something that always motivated me, uh, apart from Richard Dawkins' The Selfish Gene. gene and uh, James Harriet was kind of role model uh, that uh, you always uh, uh, looked at. And uh, after joining Corbett Foundation, I read Jim Corbett quite a lot and I'm impressed by his uh, storytelling skills. And uh, more than the tiger and leopard uh, shootings, actually what 
uh, interests me more is his book uh, titled My India, wherein he describes Indian society in great detail. Uh, with this background, I came in contact with uh, Christine and Jeremy Townend from Australia. They are based in New South Wales, and uh, they they run charities in India, in UK, uh, France, um, and she, they had founded uh, Daslin Goodwill Animal Shelter, and that shelter was being run by foreign vets uh, till I joined as a full-time resident veterinarian. Um, and uh, my thinking, my career, uh, my outlook, my perspectives, uh, they got largely influenced by these, uh, by Christine and Jeremy, uh, apart from the books that I have read and got motivated from. So as I said, uh, Kalimpong, Kalimpong in Dazling district is a hill and the animal shelter was located in a village, actually almost touching a cliff where kind of the society ended and then a cliff and the river and then again the hills and mountains will start and we could see Kanchenjunga from there. There was there is a very nice property spread over two acres of land, uh, very beautifully designed uh, operation theater and uh, your um, uh, clinic and uh, a very nice little bungalow for the resident veterinarian and cottages for volunteer vets, a lot of kennels for animals, uh, open spaces for animals, many trees. So it was such something that was like kind of heaven and in situated in, 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 in the most beautiful uh, village. It, it's called Bombasti, and uh, there was no road, no electricity connection, no computers, no internet. Um, all you could do that you have to walk for 40 minutes from the road and then you reach that place. So it was, I, I just fell in love with this place and the kind of work that the organization was doing with uh, animal welfare. And uh, so um, this is uh, on the left, you can see this was the clinic there. And um, I was working here from 2002 till 2000 and end of 2008. And uh, it was very um, relaxed setup, very informal. Uh, very disciplined. The visitors used to be very compassionate about animals. Uh, animals are well respected in the hills uh, because probably they have seen the connectivity with animals for quite a long time. And you can see like a lot of greenery all around. It was something that uh, anyone coming from urban background will like to uh, stay there, something like that. And you could see the Kanchanjanga from there. Um, the visitors were from a very wide diversity of uh, people from different walks of life. Uh, we had monks and students and Western visitors um, and uh, the people from Sikkim and even from Nepal, they used to bring their animals to us for treatment. Dazzling was, it's like three hours drive, two and a half, three hours drive from Kalimpong and people from Dazzling would I can't hear you. Uh, you have to un I, I, are, are you sharing your screen? Okay, okay, it's coming now. Sorry, initially it was. Okay, yeah. So, um, is can you see the screen? Yes, yes, right now. Yeah. yeah. So, so it kept like uh, in the late in the early twenties. I mean, this was something very exciting, and I could travel and read and uh, visit many uh, village households. So in Kalimpong subdivision, we would go for long walks for six hours, seven hours, and stay overnight wherever it, it's night and just stay. And then again, next day, start with your team, go on long trekking, uh, attending to animals and different problems that rural people would have with their animals. Uh, that was something very, very exciting. And I, I just didn't realize how quickly those six, six, seven years they passed actually. We used to have a lot of, uh, visitors, students, uh, veterinary students, uh, the staff were very cordial um, and uh, many schools, they brought their students there for exposure to animals um, and we could, we had flexibility of working on off days and uh, this was Christmas, I think 2006 um, and I, I miss my colleagues over there and in the meanwhile we realized that there should be a hospital in Darjeeling for animals. There was uh, no uh, facility where 
uh, animals would be housed for either for uh, temporary treatment, surgery, or even for long term. Um, so the, the animal shelter where I worked, it was located in Kalimpong, as I said, which was a couple of hours drive. And so when we identified the land, this was 10 kilometers down from Dazzling, uh, a, a land in a slope like pattern. And we designed the hospital, started building it, and then suddenly after cutting the earth, the whole thing collapsed. It was quite complicated and uh, it took almost one and a half year to make this facility. So this is the place where built we, we designed and built a hospital dedicated to animals with very modern facilities and very clean operation theater with a lot of light. And uh, it was designed in such a way that uh, the surgeon would be facing the Kanchanjanga mountains straight from their snow peaked uh, mountains where the vets could see. And uh, it has facility for um, vets and staff and holding animals. Um, this was something that I copied from uh, my exposure and stay at uh, Austin Human Society in Texas. So there I saw that they had this uh, glass partition, the preparation room and uh, operation section wherein it helped the vet to see actually how the next animal was being prepared and the staff engaged in preparing the animals they could see actually at what stage the surgery was and um, when the next animal was needed on the table. Um, along with this, we had uh, designed a facility for uh, reducing hypothermia, post-surgical hypothermia, especially in Darjeeling where the temperature used to be quite low. Um, hypothermia was a concern after surgery. So we had a section, we have a section wherein we could keep the animals and keep that particular area warm. And from Darjeeling, I moved to Jaipur and uh, there is Help in Suffering uh, and uh, an animal charity which was established in 1980 by late Crystal Rogers. And Crystal Rogers later on founded another charity called Compassion Unlimited Plus Action, uh, popularly called CUPA in Bangalore. And Today, Help in Suffering and CUPA in Bangalore are the top two best uh, animal charities and animal shelters in the country, which are fully functional and a quite competent team of vets and staff are there and they, they continue to produce very talented young veterinarians who, who, who go there to work and learn. And I personally believe that all the vets who are coming out of their uh, vet, vet schools uh, in India and even abroad, we get we got a lot of uh, vet interns from foreign countries. So if we if we can somehow attract young vets, young graduating vets to work for six months or one year in in these two charities, and apart from these two, there are like there is Blue Cross Chennai, which is very good. So uh, that will help uh, develop vet skills quite early in their career. And then after, when I was in Jaipur, then I, start, I was instrumental in establishing uh, uh, an, an exclusive animal shelter for camels, uh, some 40 kilometers from Jaipur on the Agra Jaipur highway. Um, I'm not able to attach the pictures here, but then uh, after three years of a stint at Jaipur, then I moved to um, Corbett Foundation in, in the year 2011. And I'm very fortunate to get an opportunity to work with a very positive and very passionate and highly academic and educated uh, conservation practitioners, uh, my colleagues at the Corbett Foundation. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about the work of Corbett Foundation uh, a bit later. And uh, I spent three years in Gujarat and then I moved to Kajranga. And uh, then I happened to see the flood for the first time in 2014. And, uh, from there onward, I have been uh, an integral part of flood mitigation teams in Kaziranga, and uh, we have been running projects for uh, community welfare and uh, disease control uh, for domestic animals, and projects to to help uh, farmers get their animals treated when their livestock are attacked by wild animals. And we have several projects for human elephant conflict mitigation as well. So I'll talk about them when we talk about um, 
Corbett Foundation if we have time uh, left with us. And as a vet, like I, I, I derive a lot of joy when uh, I'm able to do some life-saving surgeries on and off. Uh, these days, um, the frequency of surgery is quite low when compared to my initial years in my career. But uh, when such opportunities come, then it's, there's something which makes a difference to the life of uh, rural people. And then uh, it alleviates pain and suffering for individual animals, which gives a lot of satisfaction. In this image, as you can see on the left side, it's a two days old calf and there is no anal opening. So the calf cannot defecate and that makes it a very painful condition. And it's it definitely the calf would die because it just can't um, defecate. And uh, if after doing surgery, when uh, I was able to create an opening for the calf to pass on its pieces and then the calf survives and this gives a lot of satisfaction and um, as a veterinarian and and it motivates to continue going on the same path sometimes uh, i get invited to do talks and uh, this was at the university of edinburgh um, and uh, it's an interesting experience to share the stories of success and joy to uh, fellow uh, professionals in different institutions uh, apart from academic institutions. I also get opportunities to talk to uh, tribal people in Central India, uh, holding very small meetings with uh, 15, 20 people and then talking about their day-to-day -day challenges with their animal husbandries and what kind of changes they could incorporate, which, will, which would make a lot of difference for the welfare of their animals and even for their productivity. And I find these kind of small meetings more exciting than uh, meetings in academic circles. I, I find both very fascinating actually. Um, and we get a lot of uh, opportunities to work very closely with the forest department, uh, especially while immunizing animals in the fringe villages, uh, because sometimes these livestock, they venture into the peripheral areas of the park and at times, uh, some of the wild animals, they venture into, um, into human settlements. And there is an interface where a lot of engagement takes place between wild animals and livestock. So um, some of, sometimes it's very interesting to be able to work on that aspect and reduce chances of disease transmission between the two segments of uh, animals. Now, there is a lot of there, there is lot lots and lots of welfare issues which go unnoticed in rural areas but somehow we tend to believe that most of the animal welfare issues are in urban areas uh, and that's why urban animal welfare um, talks are more popular now you see this is an image from a village in uttarakhand uh, in the foothills of western himalayas and this house is a cattle shed. Now, you can see that this door is closed and even this, there is a small window which is closed. There is hardly any ventilation inside this uh, hut. And it took at least an hour to convince the lady who looked after the animals that fresh air was very important. The moment you step inside the house, you, strong stench of ammonia will greet you. And it's not, it's not good for uh, the health of the animal and it's certainly it's not animal friendly. So then, but once I took some time to explain her, she could understand and, and immediately she removed. Now you can see that there is uh, some sort of protection there because leopards are there and primarily leopards and tigers are threats because of that why this, these door and windows are permanently closed. So, and there are many houses, many, many houses where doors and windows are kept closed um, for animals. And it's very important that they protect their windows, but make them ventilation, uh, make them available for ventilation. Similarly, there are cattle owners in central India and uh, these tribal people have been using a lot of trees to fence their uh, uh, cattle sheds. And look at the amount of trees which need to be, to be uh, uh, cut down to, sustain at least one family uh, for their cattle and the cattle sheds are inside are not at all animal friendly. Uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, uneven floor and accumulation of 
uh, excreta and urine etc so there is there is there is substantial amount of work to be done in the rural areas and um, not many people are actually going there to work um, and uh, even the words of animal welfare uh, are not heard in these villages so I, I derive a lot of pleasure in doing all these things and then i try to write about my experiences and some of the stories they keep uh, publishing in uh, journals and uh, newspapers and uh, wildlife magazines. So these are some of the examples. Um, so this was in BNHS uh, Hornbill uh, magazine. And this was one of the latest uh, coffee table book that the Corbett Foundation has brought. And then I was able to contribute a chapter there uh, to on creating conservation at the agriculture wildlife interface, uh, just to add a veterinary perspective to it. Um, and during flood time, as I mentioned, there is a lot of uh, engagement uh, for us in uh, protecting the wild animals uh, from domestic animals and vice versa, as well as making and ensuring that, I mean, uh, as much as we could help for this department, we are able to extend a helping hand. So uh, thank you very much. This is primarily actually what I have been doing uh, at the moment. And uh, I was asked to talk a bit about uh, animal welfare. So I'll be very quick with this. Mostly animal welfare definitions are very skewed, very divergent, um, but then we don't, uh, we'll talk about the definition later. If we look at the animals that suffer, that, that suffer from human cruelty, mostly we see dogs uh, because they, they are, their suffering is easily visible and we are more attached to a companion animal. But from apart from dogs, we see cats, cows, oxen, and camels. Camels are often badly handled. Poultry, captive elephants, large number of wild elephants, elef uh, animals. And then of course, we human beings also suffer quite a lot. And we have high human population or in high animal population in India, which, which makes this conflict even more uh, and very intense. If you look at the welfare concerns, then all these four categories of animals, they suffer quite a lot. When it comes to working animals, they don't get job all the time the year and they are, they are not properly fed when they don't have any work. And around that time, their welfare is gravely, gravely, seriously compromised. They are overworked when they are working, they're underfed, malnourished, and they hardly get veterinary care. Even for their castration, the people, they own their animals, they would go for traditional method of castration. And I have come across hundreds of incidents wherein swollen scrotum and infected scrotum and badly injured animals would be brought to the clinic for repair work. And we can see such kind of uh, injuries inflicted by sharp objects and sometimes by the appliances used in agriculture. It's very common. This cattle was attacked by a wild boar. So there is wild, wildlife conflict as well in one of the fringe villages, which needed a lot of uh, surgical uh, work. And uh, it, the cow survived and she's doing quite well. Um, and then when it comes to production animals, uh, meat and milk, their suffering is well known. The cows, they suffer the most, despite the tag of holy mother, still she is suffering very badly. And the animals that go to slaughter, just because they're going to be slaughtered, we don't, we fail to associate welfare and pain for the animals which are going to be slaughtered. Even if the animals are going to be slaughtered, that process could be made minimum which could inflict minimum pain and suffering. We have noticed that prior to going to the shed, to the slaughterhouse, quite often the animals are made to walk long distances. They would be slaughtered in front of other animals. In some religious taboos, stunning will not be used. And the slaughterhouses are not well equipped. Animals struggle with pain. I had seen this in a couple of slaughterhouses in Coimbatore myself, and it was very tormenting. Sometimes wild animals come and pick up, like you can see this opening from here, the tiger entered and took some goats and killed some goats. Sometimes people put a lot of uh, uh, crackers to stop wild boars from coming into the agricultural fields and some other animals can suffer from it. 
a look at the image on the right side this this is an wound which has been stuffed by chili powder this was in rajasthan the second image because people believe that by putting chili powder they will be able to control uh, the infection this is bangalore as i said for companion animals the pain and suffering is easily visible but most of the time the companion animals are treated as goods in most of the societies where the kids and the young one young ones even the senior people you know sometimes they would associate ownership to pets so as we say ownership i mean the the dogs and companions they should be partners and companions rather than something which you own they are not cars and houses which could be owned but the moment we say that we will buy a dog we will buy a pet so you are associating pets to be like goods which could be bought and sold easily and the moment we in, we in, introduce our kids to that kind of concept we cannot expect them to be uh, very attached to that kind of um, uh, whole uh, uh, animal man animal relationship so and then there is poor perception of pain and suffering we we don't generally associate pain with with animals much actually and and we also we have seen that many animals are abandoned uh, when when people tra get transferred or something happens in the family or if the dog is sick or if the dog is old there are hundreds and thousands of cases that have come across where animals were abandoned look at the, some of the images you may, you may you may find them disturbing but this is what uh, i have come across when when the dogs were rescued look at look at how deep the chain has gone inside the muscle after cutting it and it took me a couple of months for the dog to recover from this situation and luckily this dog was able to get a home and when as they have got they go old people have abandoned many dogs this is bangalore look at the filth and rubbish and the environment that we are offering to our um, animals and that the suffering of wild animals and captive animals is also tremendous we talk about elephants both in the wild and in captivity they suffer quite a lot animals in the zoos they are suffering and there is a very serious uh, illegal wildlife trade going on mostly north northeast india and even central indian certain areas are predominantly involved uh, and we keep uh, reading in news like last number of animals have been confiscated in calcutta and guwahati uh which the animals were being smuggled so in all this in, in all these activities the 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 concept of animal welfare doesn't come into play but we associate mostly animal welfare with the welfare of dogs or we are very uh, animal type centric when this is what i have seen in last two decades um people don't perceive the pain of some of the species some of the groups of animals whereas they feel more pain for uh, some of the groups they are more closely attached to so this elephant i came across in uh, in jaipur this was uh, used in amir fort as, a, as a, an elephant to be to take tourists up the hill on amir fort and this was elephant number 25 moti and Uh, it, the the wound was like six inches wide and four inches deep, and the vet was treating for six months, and the wound was not responding. Later on, we found that the owner of this elephant was putting covering this whole wound with a howda, a nice, beautifully decorated cloth, and then howda, and then tourists were being you know, taken on the back of this elephant, and because of constant rubbing, the wound was not healing. Uh, here you can see the spike chains on the left image. Uh, they are very very dangerous for elephants feet on the right side also we can see arthritic elephant this was in jaldapara uh, in north bengal um, this elephant was confiscated by forest department in mumbai and uh, i was called to see it in pune and uh, she 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 is purnima and she died unfortunately because there was a lot of conflict between different agencies where the elephant should be taken taken after confiscation and finally the elephant died after a few years suffering on the road side and uh, look at the conditions of feet and blindness in captive elephants uh, some of the elephants which are with the forest department like this one in madhya pradesh i mean i was able to 
correct an abscess, uh, perform a surgery to correct abscess there, and and this recovered. But not all not all the animals will get access to veterinarians uh, in times of distress. Like this unfortunate elephant, it died on. Um, it was hit by a by a truck and in on National Highway 37, and uh, it, it died. It was just a spinal fracture, irreversible damage, irreparable damage. And um, on the left image, you can see an elephant with a hole in its feet, and still the animal, uh, the elephant was being walked. Uh, on the right side, you can see a bullet injury on an, ele um, an elephant. So there are plenty of issues actually. Even vultures are having problem with. Uh, veterinary drug diclofenac, which has been banned, but from some sources, people would be um, procuring and arranging and using uh, diclofenac that uh, that has been like it has already killed more than 95, 96 percent of the population of uh, most of the species of vultures. Um, so there are issues which are affecting wildlife. This is during the flood time when rhinos they try to find shelter, and many wild animals they come into human settlements. And there is, as I said earlier, there is a lot of interaction between wild animals and uh, domestic animals. Uh, here we can see a banded crate which was stuck in a fishing net and it had cut over its scales, etc. And then a lot of muscle damage was there. It needed surgery to uh, protect it. Um, the right image, is the python that we can see. It, this comes from Central India, wherein uh, it was attacked by the villagers while it. It was trying to eat away some of the animals. So such issues, they need prompt intervention for quick resolution, actually. This, is, this was when I was in Gujarat, uh, and uh, this, this was chased by dogs. So now when we, we are fascinated by dogs, uh, but then sometimes the same dogs could be detrimental to other species, other animals in the wild, and, and at times, even wild animals would be dangerous for dogs because we see a lot of leopards taking on dogs, and and we also read that dogs, there are dogs attacking wild animals and chasing them down, and uh, so so this both ways. But then we, it's very important that we we develop a balanced uh, understanding and uh, perception of uh, animal welfare. There are some of the images, but I think I'll stop here. Um, this was in at uh, Gaya railway station in Bihar, and my train had just left, so I couldn't uh, interact with this gentleman. I clicked this photo from the inside the compartment of the train. It was around midnight, and uh, this guy was taking around this civet cat from people to people who were sleeping on the railway platform, and uh, it was kind of used for begging. So this wild animal was used for begging uh, at Gaya station. Um, the, on the left side, the spotted deer in Bandogar, it was chased by a pack of dogs in village and then killed. Similarly, this uh, peacock on the right side, it was also chased by a pack of dogs in Jaipur and uh, we were able to save it by surgery, but uh, normally in such cases, veterinary services will not be available to um, most of the animals which inflict injury to each other. Look at this king cobra. Uh, if you see carefully at the top of its uh, eye, the scales are damaged. That was uh, because students in a school uh, had uh, tried to hit this snake with stones and it developed this injury. Um, look at this mongoose dying with uh, road accidents. So they, 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 there are many, many issues actually which wild animals are also uh, having. I have, a, I have a short uh, thing on um, animal sheltering also, but I, I like to stop here and uh, take questions if any. Um, I can ask a few questions and I think you should also cover this uh, shelter part. Um, my first question is that most often when I see people, animal lover or animal activists, there's so much working with animals that they it, it comes to a point where they don't like human anymore. They'll always focus on animal. And I've seen quite a few times, but you seem to work with both. After seeing all these cruelties, you know, after, you know, being, you know, as a vet for so long and seeing all that, but you also work with humans look like, how do you manage? How do you still have feeling for human? human? 
Well, uh, uh, Melin, what I see personally is that people don't deliberate, del people don't deliberately harm animals. Uh, so eight out of 10 times, I have realized that animals suffered because people were ignorant. So say, for example, stuffing chili powder in an in a wound in goat, the image that I have shown you, I have seen that kind of treatment being done right from Darjeeling to Madhya Pradesh to Gujarat. And it is not as if people are deriving pleasure in doing it. It is just because nobody has told them that this method doesn't work and there is a more animal friendly way of dealing with wounds actually. Uh, so probably by conducting a lot of awareness programs, we will be able to make a lot of difference. Um, I had attended a talk by a gentleman uh, on uh, emotional fatigue. He had authored a book on emotional fatigue or compassion fatigue he had called. And uh, he said that we can feel burnt out. And I believe that one of the reasons why I shifted to Corbett Foundation was because I had reached a point wherein I, 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 I thought that I needed, I needed to diversify. Otherwise, it, it was, I was going in the direction where it, it would have been very difficult to, uh, to widen my uh, area of interest and retain interest in continuing working. But your question is very valid, actually. If, uh, it's very, very important to, to travel and read a lot and understand that the cause of suffering is primarily because of ignorance and not primarily because human beings are deliberately ill-willed. So I believe so. Thank you. Um, I think we'll go a little bit more detail on, um, you know, would like to know more about your experience and your challenges um, you know, when running a shelter, when you were in shelter. What, what are the challenges that you face? Well, you see, if you start an animal shelter, then people will think that an animal shelter is bound to accept all the animals which are coming. So you will, you will come across situations wherein you will have no more space in, the, in your uh, organization for new animals and your rate of adoption will be less than the rate of inflow of animals. Your resources would be limited and then you start worrying actually how to, how to continue. So I had this difficulty, uh, some serious problems uh, on management of uh, inflow of animals and uh, rate of adoption. And it, I had to reach out to the community uh, very often for help. And rather than confining myself to the organization, I made myself a member of the village where I was located, uh, where the animal shelter was located. I, I lived on the site in the, in, in the residence provided. And I attended all the events that were going on in the local community, the villages and death functions and um, birthdays, et cetera. And then you try to create space for your uh, animals, which are actually languishing in animal shelters. And I personally believe that animal shelters are not mean for animals to be housed lifelong. I mean, animals, they need a uh, homely environment and a uh, lot of social contact and uh, enrichment, which, which despite best efforts, uh, an animal shelter won't be able to um, match as far as a proper home is uh, as as far as a proper home is concerned. So that was one challenge that I I, I faced, uh, and that's how like I approached uh, by social increasing my social circle. Uh, the next is uh, funding was a big problem. Um, so when when we were in recession in 2008 and nine, funds were drying up, and uh, we had to be more prompt in. Uh, seeking help from different different corners, and we were able to strike alliance with uh, some new partners in France and uh, in the UK, which bailed us through. But uh, resource is something which will be always a big concern for animal charities, uh, and I also believe that uh, 
people who wish to establish animal charities or shelters uh, they should have they should have independent different livelihood uh, uh, option for them and then uh, this animal shelter should come next actually uh, i have seen some of my friends um, in the last two decades who started with animal sheltering and uh, they took it as a career and then it would be very difficult to make a living and uh, then run a charity as well with, with both club together so personally i i have developed an understanding that these two should be kept separate so funding could be a challenge and then the retention of staff and vets is the biggest challenge for animal charities in india because you see um, by more or less when when we study in vet veterinary colleges we believe that we are uh, meant for uh, government jobs and uh, it takes a lot of effort in training young veterinarians in doing surgery and wound management and differential diagnosis and to learn some of the equipments that we run and um after all those training and uh, preparation suddenly in two years time uh, you lose your veterinarian because government will be hiring every two years or three years so uh, most of the animal charities in india they struggle from uh, this problem because uh, animal charities are still or jobs in ngos and animal charities animal shelters uh, these are still not considered a, a mainstream profession for by the veterinarians uh so uh, that's that's i i believe that that is the biggest challenge um which which animal charities in india are facing today i remember one of my uh, known organizations in um, visakhapatnam uh, it had lost four of its veterinarians on a single day so imagine the quantum of experience and training which goes Uh, i mean in one way it's very good that the vets who have been trained in rational human uh, rational veterinary treatment they are going to give best services for their rest of their lives uh, it makes huge difference to the skills of a veterinarian if the veterinarian works in in good animal uh, charities for 6 months or 1 year or 2 years in company with vets from different background and different countries actually Uh, but on the part of the organization it's a big drain out actually so uh, i had to face this difficulty as well and then there are some social expectations and family expectations which people uh, build up with uh, with profession and um, animal work in animal charity is not necessarily will fulfill uh, all those aspirations so it's very important for people engaged in animal sheltering and animal welfare work even vets who are going to be involved in this that they should have relational expectations from their job and uh, it is very important to identify uh, reciprocal uh, perks in terms of satisfaction by treating animals and looking at the smile of the people in the community and being able to contribute to the uh, overall health of the society so, so and if we don't recognize and factor those things then it would be a uh, very very uh, difficult for anybody to continue in animal sheltering especially in india it's not so abroad but in india things are uh, slightly different uh, thank you and um, in your in your uh, time uh, working in the shelter uh, it must be very fulfilling right it must be really fulfilling for you um do you remember any such moment that uh, you know really memorable moment you know you when you really felt good that oh. you were in the shelter working with animals yes yeah there are there are, there are many of them actually i'll just tell you one or two maybe three uh there we, i'm talking about the time when darjeeling shelter had not come up and we were still working in kalimpong only and there was there is there was a french lady who lived somewhere near batasia that famous batasia loop just before you reach darjeeling and uh, she was married to a sherpa and uh, one evening around 4 o'clock she called me and she said that she was driving to kalimpong because her cat had galloped a threaded needle 
and so on and, and she had very strong french access when she spoke english so uh, it was around 4 30 pm and by the time she reached our hospital it was already i think six six kind of and 6 pm is too late in the hills so half of the people would have finished their drinks and dinner and they would be preparing for bed uh, and then in those days we didn't have radiographic facility i'm talking about 2004 or 5 probably so i had to take the cat in a basket and go to a, a nursing home a human hospital that was known to me and primarily a gynecological hospital and and there i used to get my radiology work done uh, but then when i met the doctor over there he said that uh, his staff were all out uh, out means like kind of drunk and uh, they there was no option so i stayed overnight in the main road at my friend's place and the next morning i could go uh, to the surgery uh, to the radiology place and then get it get it ready wrapped and the road which led to our hospital was quite bumpy so i was not willing to risk driving back to the hospital with the cat with a threaded needle in the tummy i didn't know where it was going to poke into so i i called my instruments at uh, at a friend's place in the main road of the Kalifong town and performed surgery in one of the corners of the uh, of, of his shop uh, and the lady the, the lady, cat lady, she was excited when she saw the threaded needle coming out of the tummy and the cat bouncing around happy after 7 p.m. going back. So that was something uh, very, very satisfying because that you can, you can read on the face of the, of the, of the uh, lady how happy she was. Uh, similarly, I remember on one winter early morning around 6, 7 o'clock, a gentleman knocked my door and uh, he had walked a couple of hours from a village. Um, I think it was cheap. I, I think it was Chibo Basti, quite far away from our hospital. And he, he said that his newly born calf was passing stool from the urinary part. That was the complaint that he made. So then I had to walk again with my team and check the calf there and uh, th th it was a case of rectovaginal fistula so there was there was no ns and the, there was a hole between the between the between the rectum and the vagina and the stool was coming down and passing and actually it was life threatening so we had to bring the calf to the hospital and and i, I had to do a surgery it took quite some time and uh, Later on, the calf stayed with me in my um, in my bedroom, and we shared some one week time together. And it went back after seven days, very happy and healthy. And and the same same owner came back to our hospital after three years, and he brought some milk and he said that the that, that little calf had delivered new calf. And then you you like you connect with your 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 patients, and you can see the happiness and satisfaction and relief on the face of the owners and and more than that like you know that you have reduced pain and suffering for some animals which can't speak for themselves so uh, there there are there, there was another uh, pelican and um, i remember there was a pelican in uh, jaipur uh, which which had collided with uh, and uh, with kingfisher airlines in those days this was around 2009 and and it had come to my clinic and uh, we were able to uh, save quite some time with us after surgery. So, um, yeah, those were the moments that I cherish actually. All right. Um, maybe we should go to the next phase of your life now. Uh, the next presentation? Yes. Can you see it? Yes. Yes. So you asked about uh, animal shelters. So as I said, like definition of animal welfare is quite uh, valid, but normally the, the one that I find most comprehensive 
uh, states that complete mental and physical health and uh, where the animal's harmony with its environment is very important. So say if we have a dog at home and the dog gets enough food and it gets enough winter clothes and a beautiful collar, but then if no one actually talks to the dog, if no one sits with it, and if it doesn't get that environment, uh, then I, I would seriously think that its welfare is gravely compromised uh, because we know that uh, companion animals, they like uh, social contact and uh, social enrichment. So it is, I find this definition quite uh, inclusive, uh, but then our cultural instinct uh, uh, and preference for some animals uh, overpowers our uh, interpretation of this animal welfare. And when talking about animal sheltering, it's very important to understand why to shelter, when to shelter, how long to shelter, and what will happen to those animals if we keep in the shelter? And then we will will we be able to meet the welfare concerns and requirements of the animals that has been sheltered? I get I get phone calls and emails quite often asking for help on guiding how to start an animal charity and uh, how to establish a shelter. And most of the time, the the good-hearted people who call, they are more driven by their instinct to help animals but in that emotional search uh, sometimes they fail to identify the practical realities or the resource limitations which uh, which people don't immediately see actually so uh, that uh, we have to think in the beginning itself before we con consider animal sheltering so not all the animals that we see on the streets need to be sheltered if we try to do that, then no amount how big we make an animal shelter, it will not be sufficient for holding um, all the animals. And I personally believe that animals should not be sheltered for their all life, actually. The animal should come to the shelter with an objective of getting good health examination and temporary stay and spay, neuter, et cetera, vaccination. And then there should be every effort for the animals to go back. And then when we talk about the basic facilities and the nature and how will they, how they will be maintained, then we have to create enough space. When we say enough space means enough space based on the behavior and behavioral need of that particular uh, animal type of the animal. And different species or breeds should have facility for separate housing. So like if we have aviary very close to our kennels, then it would be very stressful for the birds. So we have to know actually how those sections would be separated. And the kennels should be designed in such a way that they are very easy to clean. Um, and when in Darjeeling and Kalimpong, as I said, cold was, low temperature was a very big concern. So we had designed a wooden platform, which was kind of six inches off the ground. And there will be gunny bags, which would hold the animals warm at night. Um, even in, in on the streets also, the animals, they will curl up with whatever thing is available for them. But if we confine them in a kennel without any such object, it will be very difficult for them to tolerate low temperatures. Um, and then we have to encourage co-housing. If we know the behavior of the animals, then certain, certain types of animals, they will be more, uh, they will be happier if they are co-housing. And we should have a facility for admin section separately from the animal section. These two should not be merged. And similarly, we should have separate facilities for euthanasia, intake and adoptions. And euthanasia facility should definitely be very, very uh, separated. Uh, in fact, euthanasia is a subject which should be discussed and debated uh, properly in, in Indian, Indian uh, organizations. This is something which uh, gets suppressed and many animals, they suffer because the organization has not developed a policy on euthanasia. There should also be scope and space for veterinarians, volunteers, visitors, and interns. So these are the basic facilities. I'll tell you what we had at, at our Kalimpong and Darjeeling shelter. So as we enter, we had a visitor section where they could be uh, greeted and then I showed in the photograph, so we had a preparation room, uh, which was separated from the operation room, but there was a connectivity, visibility between the two. 
And as I had mentioned, there was a post-operative care uh, facility to keep the animals warm. And there were kennels enough in number, properly designed, very secured. Sometimes animals will escape from the kennels also. So the kennels have to be have double layer of security. So one is the locking of the kennel, and then there is a uh, chain linked fence uh, all around the main structure. And there we have to be very careful that we should never ever use uh, spiked. Uh, barbed wire fencing in any animal facility, be it in wild, wild or be it in bottoms of animals or plant animals. And uh, there was a separate cattery that I had designed in 2007. Um, and then volunteers cottage, admin block. We had a meeting hall where we, we would give presentations to visitors. Um, and then there were a couple of kitchens, one exclusively for dogs, for, for, for the animals that were uh, hospitalized or admitted, or even for our own shelter dogs, and then a separate kitchen for the staff, and lots and lots of open space, lot of many trees, and very positive environment. Uh, that, that I, I believe that these are the minimum things that one has to look at when it's designing an animal hospital. Uh, and then overall, the entire property should have very strong security cover, in sense of like it should be escape proof because we would come across many situations wherein uh, while handing the animals from one section to the other sections if there is slight carelessness then the animal will escape it, it it had happened on many occasions so that should not happen because if a dog or if a cat comes from point x then that animal should go back to the same point after surgery. That has to be the rule. Um, there should be a policy for population management. I have seen many uh, organizations in Rajasthan and even in Gujarat being flooded with animals because not because new animals are coming, but because just their in-house animals are breeding quite a lot. So for such cases, there should be population management. So every animal that is going to stay in the property or the premises that animal should be assessed for its health. It should be spayed or neutered. It should be vaccinated. And every effort should be made to uh, ensure that that animal gets a home. Shelter is not the best home for all life. The best home is a home where there are people available 24 seven. And then how to manage data. I'll tell you one thing like in Jaipur, we were doing um, spay neuter surgery since 1995. That was the first spay neuter surgery in India, which was supported by WSPA UK, the Animal Welfare Board of India also supported. And uh, um, we had a very detailed uh, sheet wherein we would fill up information. And when we were collecting those information, like uh, how many animals were in heat and uh, how many animals were pregnant and how many, what was the color, what was the weight, and from which area they came. And we were just noting down everything. It went on for some 15 years until one statistician from UK happened to visit our facility. And he looked at the record and he said that it was a mine of information. And then we were able to publish six good quality papers in peer reviewed journals about dog ecology, uh, just because we had collected those data very meticulously. So, a very strong message is that you must maintain your record very, very clearly, thoroughly, and unadulterated. Reports, records must be maintained. When an animal comes into the hospital, it's or the shelter, its origin point, its color, weight, healthy status. Uh, if there is, if the animal is microchipped, to be assessed if the animal is microchipped already. Most likely, it won't be done in India. But then uh, we have to undertake a very thorough health examination for animals and keep the document ready, file it properly, and let all the staff members know that this document has been produced for so and so animal. And then when it comes to keeping the animals healthy, it has to be done by keeping the premises very, very clean. We have to disinfect the, uh, the facility properly. And there is a very, very serious in emphasis on enrichment uh, because I have seen dogs barking all day and chewing the materials, whatever is available in the 
can and even like their their uh, feeding balls or water balls um, and unless and until we address this the same thing happens with the uh, uh, sloth bear if we keep uh, bears for rehabilitation or if we keep even elephants elephant calves also then unless and until we ensure enrichment they will have very difficult times especially for social animals like elephants monkeys and uh, dogs and cats and then there should be a policy to encourage volunteers and there should be a, a written document on how you accept volunteers what are the terms and conditions so in our case like we accepted foreign vets only if they were willing to stay for three months. So for less than three months, it's very difficult to, to train someone in your methodology and if the person is not going to leave in a sufficient time. So that should be very clear. And for the vets who would come for six months, we would pay return airfare. So that, that was one way of attracting vets from different countries and we would provide food and accommodation on the premises and that would ensure that one veterinarian will be available 24 seven. So somehow I, I find that uh, uh, enhancing volunteer work in animal charity would reduce the cost and resource required to run the charities for a long time. So that is something that uh, we have to look at. Uh, Navin, uh, one yeah. question. Uh, what, what software do you use or what tool do you use to attract veterinarian? Do you use Wolfing or um, what is, or Workaway? What, what app do you use to get a veterinarian from abroad? Well, um, the time I was talking uh, in those days, there were no apps. So we, we, ha we had a membership at the British Veterinary Association and our work was quite known in in the UK because Wildlife Society, WSPA was uh, a funding partner. So we used to get vets through our British contacts in British Veterinary Association, as well as through uh, uh, RSPCA and WSPA. But uh, in those days, there were no, uh, we didn't use softwares and all. And when the vets will get in contact, then we would interact with them personally. But of course, these days we will have to go for uh, app and software. I mean, I'm talking about something 12, 13 years ago. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, so then many animal charities have to plan uh, evacuation strategy, especially suppose if we run an animal charity in, in Kaziranga, Assam, then we have to look at the look location first that the location should be flood proof and suppose if suddenly water enters into that area how are we going to evacuate our staff how will we evacuate the animals those things have to be planned so there should be a disaster plan in writing uh, when planning an animal sh uh, shelter uh, and then uh, when i was in austin human society in texas then i came across i was introduced to a method of matchmaking for dogs so what happens like uh, potential people who were who were going to adopt uh, dog, adopt animals from the, the from Austin Human Society, they would be given a, a fixed appointment uh, for coming and meeting the prospective uh, uh, pet. And uh, it used to be um, at least um, sixty to ninety minutes long session, wherein uh, people would spend time knowing uh, each other. Like the, the animal will be able to assess the behavior of the person whom he was going to be taken to and vice versa. Uh, and also for if the if the order happened to have an animal already at home, then that animal would be brought at the second meeting and these dogs would be uh, allowed to interact slowly. They, they call it soft interaction, hard interaction. So uh, it's very important that we understand the importance of um, this a kind of um, measures while trying to get home for the animals. And uh, now needless to say that every animal that goes out must be spayed, neutered, vaccinated, and all the records should be given to the people who are going to take the animals with them. And there should be a formal, uh, uh, formal document work to sign uh, while animals are being adopted. At the same time, similarly, when animals are being taken, there is a very, very, very clear and very well drafted uh, document that people sign while surrendering animals. Those, those two things have to be uh, 
kept, kept in mind. And then we need to look at the capacity building of the staff. It needs a lot of patience. Um, sometimes they are just tired and then you will see mistakes creeping in. And this we would know by uh, the prolonged recovery time of animals as a group or uh, this, 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 the uh, leader of the team, the team leader has to uh, apprehend and understand and identify the need for training program and, and job rotation will help a lot. So when you asked me like how I dealt with the situations and challenges when they came in running the shelter, then job rotation and uh, shifting was very, very helpful. They, they two were very helpful. And we have to look at the staff welfare also. Uh, quite often we have seen in the last two decades that the people who work in animal charities as supportive staff, they come from unprivileged section of the society. And uh, somehow I feel that they are not fairly treated in many places in our country. So when we run an animal charity, it is very, very important that we try to be very humane with uh, our uh, human colleagues um, and as much as we will be soft and kind to animals. So uh, this I have already explained the importance of connecting with the community. So I will strongly suggest to look at the websites of Helping Suffering in Jaipur, uh, where I was working till 2011 and uh, Compassion Unlimited Plus Action. This is one organization established, the second one established by late Crystal Rogers uh, in Bangalore, and then Blue Cross Chennai, which is run by Dr. Chinni Krishna. You should also look at Animal Aid in Udaipur, run by Erika and her husband and her daughter. So you can also look at many other organizations, but these four, uh, personally, uh, I really appreciate the kind of contribution that these four animal shelters and animal charities have done in India, not only to improve the welfare of animals, but even to improve the quality of veterinary uh, professionals in this country. Uh, and these four organizations have raised the bar for animal welfare. So I will strongly recommend all of you to visit to their websites and try to understand what they do, how they do. And in case you, you are planning to start a charity, these organizations will be very, very welcoming to you. And they will like to share their uh, secrets and their failures and successes so that you don't reinvent the wheel and you, you have uh, uh, an advantageous startup. So I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Quite a lot of information. <laughs> I think I'm, sh I'm sure that we have to invite you again in the future to go more detail. Yeah. Um, it's around uh, 7 or 9, so we have some time. Um, if anybody else has question, otherwise I have some question. I, um, we haven't received question in Facebook yet because most likely people are enjoying Christmas with their family. Um, sorry to keep you away from your family. I do not know whether you, should, uh, you know, celebrate Christmas or not. Um, I like to be here with you because uh, here we do not celebrate Christmas and I miss my friends uh, outside. So I, I rather I have lots of questions to ask to you. Uh, one question is, um, you know, you men mentioned that from shelter, you know, it should go back. But if you uh, rescue a dog uh, or an animal or cat, whatever, and you spend lots of time and resources to, you know, uh, cure them, cure the dog. And then you, uh, you get attached to the dog and you don't want to put back, put him or her back to, back on street. And of course, your shelter is getting full, as you mentioned. What do you do? What do your suggestion, first of all? I mean, do you think that it's better to, you know, put them back on street or, you know, I'm, I'm sure that you will say that work on adoption, but as you know, the adoption of indie dogs is difficult and that also, you know, uh, what do you call, uh, adult 
female dog more difficult? So what is your suggestion? Second question is, what do you advise to improve adoption, you know, specifically again, you know, street dogs? Those are first. Uh... Yeah, so uh, you see in the US, Annually, many dogs are put down in animal shelters because there is no space. I, I think either the figure is 4.2 million dogs per year, which I strongly oppose actually. And I believe that no animal should be put down just because you don't have space. Because if you don't have space, that's your problem and, and an animal should not suffer because of that. Uh, so, that should be totally out of the question. Uh, euthanasia is only for conditions wherein there is irreparable damage and there is no hope of revival and the animal is in great pain. So I totally oppose any euthanasia just on the ground of less space availability. So if, uh, and then for the animals to, when I see, look, I mean, when I was in Jaipur, we used to get on an average around 18 to 20 animals with different kinds of injuries and all. So, and then we had two acres of land, which was, I think, which was donated by Maharani Gayatri Devi long, long ago to Crystal Rogers. And probably, that two acre property in Maharani farm, that area of Durgapura where it was, it is located. It is the biggest chunk of land now and every inch is sold. You just can't increase your space and capacity even if you have money, there is no, there is no place left. So what option does help in suffering have? Either they, if, if they don't return back the animals, there are, there are two ways the animals could go back. One is that an animal has met with an injury animal, someone has complained, the animal comes to the hospital, it stays there for 10, 12 days, it recovers, it should go back to that place. Otherwise, what happens, that place is occupied by another animal. But then suppose if someone just makes a phone call and says that there is a dog outside my house, just pick it up. Now that is not, that is not, that's not a reason to pick up a dog or any animal from anywhere just because someone has a problem. So if the animal comes with some injury or something, then it makes a valid reason for the animal to come. There are other ways of animals coming would be that someone just surrenders the animal and runs away. And then you, are, you have no choice but to keep the animal with you. Uh, that also happened many, many times. Um, sometimes people are being transferred and they don't know what to do there with, with their dog and, or cat. And sometimes they can request you to keep the animal. And then there are situations wherein some persons in the society who are genuinely concerned for animals, they may request, and there are certain requests which can't be turned down. So there are situations wherein animals will keep coming. Now, if the animals don't go back, uh, for, for, the, for the animals that have a niche in the society, those animals must be sent back because those animals are looked after by some people who would would greatly miss the absence of those animals and they should go back. If they are not returned back, that niche is occupied by another unknown new animals and that increases intra-species fight between different uh, individuals. But then in my experience, I have, we have been very successful with adoptions. Uh, primarily I believe because there is a very companion culture in, in the hills. So it was easier for us. And the more we interacted with school students, the more it got easier to get animals rehomed. And I remember one of the adoption drives that I, that I attended at a lakeside in Austin, wherein the dogs were, the, 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 the pups were driven to that lake and then there was open adoption scheme when people just would walk in and they will, but then it was not a great success, I, I, I understand. But now coming back to your point, if I compare Kalimpong and Jaipur, then getting animals adopted would be very high in, in Kalimpong. 
and it would not be so successful in Jaipur. Primarily because in Jaipur, our connectivity with the schools was quite low. There was a lot of heavy animal work and the, there was very little emphasis on connecting with schools, students, clubs, Rotary Club and the community. It was very, very low, low priority. Whereas in Kalimpong, in the hills, we had more access to schools and clubs and uh, uh, different institutions. So it was easier. Uh, personally, I believe that we should try to increase our social circle beyond our office and see that we find homes for animals. Uh, M, have I answered your uh, question? Yes, yes, you did. Um, then um, some quick question. Um, you know, often we see, uh, you know, cows, you know, got hit by car, their leg has to be amputated. So do you have any um, doctor or organization that you work to get prostate, prosthetic legs? Yes, uh, for, I mean, I'll be able to put you in touch with the groups which are now able to do it actually. Okay. And uh, yeah, for, for domestic animals now, it can be done. Uh, unfortunately, for, for animals which are to be rehabilitated in the wild, it is not feasible, but uh, these days, even for elephants, uh, prosthetic limbs uh, are being designed and implemented. And certainly for, uh, um, for companion animals, yes. And even for domestic animals, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, and then I, quite often I hear from people from villages or, you know, tea garden. Now, if you talk about ticks and they say, oh, put some phenol, you know, give some phenol like that. What do you have to say to people who, you know, use phenol to okay. remove ticks? Yeah. So uh, the most common things which are used is phenol, phenyl, and uh, uh, petrol diesel. Even on dogs which suffer from mange, I have seen people applying these things as well as um, as well as uh, mobile oil. Now we must tell everyone that none of these work. This doesn't doesn't work. First of all, and for ticks, there are drugs available in the market which we veterinarians very routinely uh, recommend and people in villages, those people who keep cows and all, they know uh, the name of the medicine. Uh, it's Butox and it's easily available even for dogs. Uh, there are products called Rind, which can be added in water and uh, uh, then the dog can be given a bath and then ticks and all they vanish. But I don't generally recommend uh, drugs for uh, ticks because the drugs that we use for killing ticks, actually those drugs have got very broad spectrum of activity. And in fact, they will be killing any invertebrate that will come in contact with the medicine, number one. Number two, that say the drug gets eliminated from in the dung, almost 98% unchanged, unmetabolized. And the beetles and insects, which will be feeding on, on, on the dung, uh, their life cycle is gravely uh, affected. And you will see a decline in the population of beetles and insects in, in the areas where cattle, they graze. And if the cattle has have been treated by these drugs like butox and red or ivermectin and other, this group of drugs. So for ticks, uh, of course, uh, we can use these drugs if we want to, and many people they use. Uh, it's rampantly used drug, but because of my background now with uh, wildlife conservation, I'm quite worried about the impact of uh, these molecules on uh, smaller, uh, lower life forms. Because you see, these, these dung contaminate our rivers and streams even these animals, when these drugs are applied on them, every day they are going out for grazing and they would be feeding, urinating and defecating and drinking in streams. And they contaminate the streams and the drug molecules, they go into river streams, which are feeding our 
uh, forested areas and many uh, pristine areas. And our overall uh, biodiversity will be badly affected if these molecules are very widely used. So personally, I have not recommended anyone any drug for ticks for quite long time. Uh, personally, for companion animals, I will probably advise to use uh, anti-tick or anti-fleece collar if it's available. And for, for livestock owners, my suggestion is always to uh, pluck out the ticks every day when the animal comes back from grazing. Then you look for, spread your hands over the body of your animal and just pick up because new ticks will be hardly 10 to 15 uh, new arrivals in a day. And those ticks shouldn't be just try to kill actually. They don't generally die so easily, but somehow I believe that um, mechanical removal of ticks is more feasible rather than um, medic medicine application because what happens even if we treat our animals, generally we don't treat the sheds where the animals are actually staying. And we have a serious limitation in keeping the sheds cleaned because the sheds are not designed for disinfectant type of cleaning process. Mm. So in absence of treatment of the sheds where the animals are going to stay, if we just focus on giving drugs to our animals, these animals will go take the drugs, but again, the ticks will come back because the ticks are there in the micro environment as well as in the forested areas where these animals are going for grazing. So, I mean, this is, this is slightly unconventional suggestion, but this is what I believe we should do. Okay. Um, uh, other question is, have you been involved with SPCA and SPCA specifically in Assam, in Kaziranga? Do you have a SPCA within that uh, district? I think there is no SPCA, but um, I don't, I'm not aware of, okay. I'm not aware of. All right. I'm so, not, yeah, I, I don't think that uh, there are animal welfare organizations um, probably beyond Gohati. Uh, no, because of this webinar, we have been in touch with a few. Uh, they are in Dibrugar and Jurhat in Tezpur. And, uh, you know, it is coming up. Young organization, you know, we are networking with them. Right, so right. Uh, you'll be happy to know that uh, in small, small areas, it has come up. They are very young, though, you know. So, yeah. Uh, and we are, we are, you know, we would like to meet with the, you know, uh, DC uh, regarding SPCA in Assam. I just wanted to know if you are involved in that area or if we could use you uh, sometime you know, for those talks because you have wealth of knowledge. Um, uh, also, I have two quick questions before, you know, it's almost time, but. Um, wanted to know what exactly you are doing right now at uh, for Cor you know Corvette Foundation and uh, um, you know say we need help uh, for tiger if we come to know there's a tiger con human conflict or can we reach out to you like what are the main thing you are doing okay so we can reach yeah. Out to you? yeah yeah so f first thing that in case of uh, straying out of tigers there is a uh, uh, National Tiger Conservation Authority, NTCA. And uh, under the NTCA guidelines, a committee is formed. Um, and quite often I am NTCA representative in the committees when a straying of tigers takes place. Uh, whereas for a straying of rhinos, no such committee is required. Uh, but then uh, we are not involved in, um, in uh, addressing uh, strain tiger issues directly. So the forest department has a collaboration with uh, Wildlife Trust of India and they have a very competent team of people uh, who respond to such distress calls very promptly, very efficient and a very, very capable team of uh, vets and staff. So um, in case, uh, I mean, first of all, I will definitely pass on the contacts of there so that you have it in your directory. 
and the second thing is that if you can if you call me then i will also immediately uh, pass the information and uh, such a string will be promptly responded and addressed there is no doubt about it number one and uh, number two like what we what uh, we are doing is uh, first of all we are involved in human elephant conflict mitigation and we run, we run projects which are based on uh, solar powered fences for certain areas and for certain areas improvisation of traditional tongis and uh, publication of booklets uh, then we are also involved in uh, livestock section of the the villages which are in the fringe of the park where uh, an interface exists for wildlife and livestock to interact so we are looking at that and then i have a project uh, for going on in uh, tamenglong in manipur um, 150 kilometers from the capital city of Imphal, up northwest, wherein uh, we are looking at uh, uh, controlling uh, use of animals from the from the forests, primarily for uh, illegal wildlife trade or even for bushmeat uh, hunting, uh, through providing alternative livelihood schemes, and uh, uh, we are looking at regeneration of. Uh, forested uh, of the areas which have been degraded because of zoom cultivation. So uh, those are the primarily interventions that we are doing. And in Kaziranga, we run a project called Conservation Education Project in which uh, we have targeted 32 villages where uh, we have identified six primary topics which need to be addressed in those villages and we are working on that. And apart from that, I'm involved in Central India in running veterinary pro mobile veterinary services in in uh, 60 villages around uh, Bandagad and Kanha Tiger Reserve. So those things keep me quite occupied. And and then, of, of course, apart from these, a lot of reading and writing goes on. So uh, for livelihood, you know, uh, you, you mentioned that you are working on livelihood, you know, to re also maybe to reduce human and animal conflict. What kind of livelihood? And also, do you know, you know, is there anything like uh, the El Rhino, you must have heard about that organization called El Rhino, who are using the animal and uh, rhino dunk to make some book and stuff like that. So if you could tell us a little bit about livelihood thing. Yeah, so um, in, in Indian condition, in, in under the within the Indian Wildlife Protection Act 1972, it would be probably very complicated to use uh, rhino dunk even for a livelihood project also because uh, no, even dung is from the protected area, it would be uh, next to impossible to procure mm. uh, for any project. Uh, but in our livelihood initiatives, we have uh, experimented with, uh, um, with hospitality, in which hospitality training was given to selected uh, boys and girls, and that attracted 100% placement. Uh, both locally, even as uh, outside Assam, and in our Kanha and Bandagar units, our uh, trainees from hospitality sector they had been they now they are posted in Hyderabad and some in Mumbai also. And then we experimented with candle making, which was a flop. So it it just failed because we could not identify and both there was fault in both the ends in raw material procurement as well as access to market. So our uh, effort with uh, with uh, candle making was a failure and then um, we also had another failure which i'm forgetting actually but then we had good success with uh, honey beekeeping so we tied up with a gentleman called uh, uh, mr datta leela charan datta in jorhat he is he is, I believe he is the large, he is the largest honey producer in the entire Northeast. Um, I, I believe that his annual output of honey some five years ago was 8 million rupees worth. Uh, I'm not aware currently what the quantum is, but he's a very knowledgeable man. He runs his own laboratory to certify honey in Jorhat, slightly away from Jorhat. I can put you in touch with him if you wish to. Yes, definitely. Yeah. And uh, he, he works as a resource person for our honey beekeeping programs. Um, and we have, uh, we keep in touch with the, the mostly women are involved in this. And uh, it has been going on quite well um, in, in villages near Kaziranga as well as near Numligad also we have uh, 
couple of villages like now pathar where we are doing it and it has given us good success the third one which has been very good is uh, handloom so uh, as we know in assam every almost every household every family knows how to weave clothes but here what we noticed that most of the weaving was centered to their own requirement uh, and primarily they produced nekla sadar and uh, gamsa so we have introduced them to produce things and designs which actually sell for people outside assam so that has been doing quite well uh, there are villages like tamli pathar and jhapri pathar and sukani gaon where we have established community weaving centers so in 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 the villages around kaziranga we have made four highlands inside the villages for the people to take shelter during flood time so there are highlands inside the park for animals but we have made highlands outside the park in the villages for the villagers because there is no place where they could they could they can keep their wild uh, sorry their domestic animals and their fodder actually so on those highlands we have built uh, community weaving centers and then the group of 12 to 16 women they they work together and it is like our engagement is now not there it is totally managed completely managed by the women themselves and they get uh, demands from boka khat uh, market which they have to work hard to fulfill their demands so um, so these are some of the interventions which have been running well and so i i mentioned about uh, uh, candle making which didn't take up and there was something else which didn't take up i'm forgetting the name okay and my last question i have one more question so uh, quite often people uh, i mean i i came across people who think that there's more animal cruelty in uh, rural areas than the urban area uh, because uh, you know the rural areas where there's more tribal more tribal people is that true and we would i would like to know your opinion on that well um again i'll say that this is an incomplete sentence um the the in tribal areas i mean we will have to be slightly we have to elaborate actually see if we talk about some of the tribes which have depended on bush meat hunting and eating wild animals by traditionally by hunting then we will have to look relook at actually from which whose point of view i am looking actually if we look from the villagers point of view then it's not that big quality issue so if we generalize the animal welfare concerns then i will say that lot of animal welfare issues are there in villages there is no doubt about it and those issues could be addressed by running proper education and awareness programs whereas the challenges which are there in urban areas those challenges will not be only addressed by education and awareness so even if the magnitude of animal welfare concerns in rural areas will be probably bigger their dimension can easily be addressed and contained whereas the urban challenges are more complex to handle but it is true it is true that there are animal welfare concerns in villages which go unnoticed unreported because most of the organizations they are city centric and i'm quite glad to know from you that young people are opening uh, charities and all in smaller areas also of course jorhat and tezpur are not small but uh, most of the things are guwahati centric and if i'm hearing that uh places like tejpur jorhat and dibrugarh are having animal charities it's such a positive thing and i really i'm very happy with this thank you i mean we 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 are every day we are uh, coming you know we're getting to know new organizations and there are some organizations in barpeta now and uh, you know either they are forming or you know filing uh, for organization or also at sunapur and things like that so lots of young people had um, step in and uh, doing animal spe- specifically domesticated animal so right so we had a very interesting uh, uh, event today at least i get to know 
quite a lot of uh, um, things yeah, about uh, shelter and animal welfare. I really wanted to thank you from bottom of my heart, um, specifically making Northeast a better place to live. You know, you are bringing so much of knowledge and we look forward to work with you more so that we can make Assam one of the best place for animals too. I'm sure there's a long, long way to yeah. go. Thank, thank you very much, Milin. And it, it has been a pleasure to talk so leisurely for so long. And um, yeah, I'm really very, very, very happy. And particularly happy to note that there are organizations which are coming up for farming animals. You see, most of the animal welfare concerns and organizations in India are either urban centric or they are restricted to dogs and cats, primarily to dogs. And a lot of suffering is there in rural areas, especially for livestock and poultry. So I'm, I'm quite happy and I'll be quite happy to be connected further. Um, you know, other organizations, I'm not saying that they are in a rural area, they are still in town, they are in Dibruger town or Zurhat town, but there is this organization called Human Society International, they are also, you know, working on addressing the same issue about, you know, cruelty, I guess, uh, farm animal. You know, they're bringing those things up. They're also talking about transportation. You know, you, you see the chicken, lots of chicken putting in a bicycle and they're just carrying those, the, you know, transportation issues and stuff like that. So people are, uh, ad, you know, talking about them. So we are far behind from Maharashtra and other places, but, you know, we are bringing people together, at least through Anazuri's point of view, we are trying to bring various organizations together, getting educated, you know, having webinar like this, so that, you know, now we have to think more and we have to think more, you know, uh, you know, think, maybe we can invite you about, you know, I know that um, Nandini wanted to know about animal Catery, uh, Catery, how to start one, what are the issues? We didn't have time to talk about that, but maybe in the future we can have, have you again, where uh, specifically to talk about more deeper about animal shelters and uh, stuff like that. Yeah, so, sure. So Merry Christmas once again. Yeah, thank you, same to you. And thank you and see you shortly again. Yeah, sure. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Yeah.